Hello and welcome to Getting APIs to Work. In today's episode, we're joined by Phil Sturgeon of Stoplight. Hey, Phil, how are you doing? Hey, hello, I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. So today we're focusing on spectral and API linting. Spectral is one of those tools that is part of this overall suit of tools, let's say, that Stoplight is providing. But the idea is that you can also use it as a standalone thing, or you can integrate it into your own workflows. Yeah. So I think it's really interesting, not just for people looking for Stoplight, but people interested in API linting. So when I think about API linting, I think the the scenario where I've seen that mentioned most of the time is organization-wide API guidelines. Organizations mm -hmm. that try to harmonize APIs a little bit, help with API designs, help designers to make good decisions. And that's where I've seen this idea of API linting being the most popular one. I'm just curious, from your experience, have you seen any other scenarios where API linting, the general concept, is something that people are looking at? Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's elements of it. There's there's tools that exist in in kind of the GraphQL community. This one called GraphQL Doctor, which will look for kind of basic mistakes and breaking changes in pull requests, things like that. Um, there's there's some stuff floating around for graph uh, for gRPC, and and there's actually a few tools now in in the API world. Um, I helped make two of them, <laughs> but a few people have kind of put them together. And a lot of a lot of the time, it's kind of homegrown solutions. There are companies like. HSBC and a lot of other big organizations that are really into design first or trying to get there. Um, you know, a lot of people are mixed match. Um, different teams do different things, but a lot of people have been rolling homegrown solutions where they they kind of try to make their own automated tools. But honestly, most people's um, most people's approach to API standardization is to write a really big word doc and hope people read it often. Uh, and fully, uh, which isn't the best best approach. So um, now that these tools are starting to mature, people are kind of going, oh, thank God, and, and jumping on them. But um, they're still quite a new idea to a lot of people, I think. Yeah, that's a good point. I've, I've been trying to convince people to at least not write Word docs, but maybe yeah. write a doc on GitHub or something where people can actually collaborate around it. So that already is one. It's a small step, but I think it already is something. <laughs> Absolutely. You don't want to keep emailing it around with version yeah, 12. Version right. like, which version do you have? Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I'm interested in, just to get your insight into what people are actually doing. So Spectral is a good example of one tooling that popped up. I actually mm -hmm. think that Spectral will become relatively successful because it's, it's a useful tool to have. Is there mm -hmm. another tool you know, in, on that general trajectory of be doing better than having the shared word document. Is there another area where you see a tool appearing or potential for tooling to appear apart from this API linting and spectral? I, I know that we've had conversations in the past about kind of governance not really being a thing yet. You know, like uh, yeah. everyone's really excited about governance and not that many people really know what it means. And, and to some people it means kind of contract testing and to other people it means um, you know, uh, model reuse across different APIs. And there's all these kind of ideas of governance just being like, do gooder with your APIs, like make them make them better somehow, enforce better. Um, and, and so I think API linting can be one of those things where you, you put your style guides in and it starts to show you kind of errors as you make pull requests or as you use the editor or as you whatever it is that you're doing. Um, but I think some sort of tool that will gather up that information and then kind of display it to the API design reviewers or the kind of API center of excellence or whatever you call them in your specific organization. Um, I think those people kind of need some sort of tool that will amass all of that information and help people figure out like which APIs are struggling the most, which rules matter more than others, and 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 maybe even some other tooling around like automatically solving those problems instead of just saying, hey, this is bad, you know, uh, another tool that could then like fix it for you, um, like ESLint does sometimes in Prettifier, you know. I think I think with that you have given the API industry kind of good guidelines for the next couple of years. It's <laughs> yeah. pretty ambitious. Um, Get on with but it. Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen companies <laughs> like building their own dashboards, a lot of it yeah. manual, but they realize that well, it's manual, but it's better than not having a dashboard. So um, that's yeah. a good first step. And like you say, ideally, of course, those dashboards would be more automated. Ideally, mm -hmm. there's even automated ways how you can fix things along the way. 
So yeah, um, yeah I think we'll see actually a lot of that. The, the more we see API landscape growing and the utility, but also the let's say the criticality of API landscapes becoming apparent that if you know if, yeah. if you do a bad job at managing your API landscape, you're actually hurting the organization. <laughs> And yeah. the, the more we see that happening, I think the more we will see people putting work into improving that. That were, I think, some interesting general thoughts on you know where this thing fits into the landscape. Now, I would really like to dive a little bit into what Spectral is. And mm -hmm. first, what I want to do is just talk a little bit and not so much about how it does things, but... What does it do? And also, because I think that's always important for people to also hear very clearly, what does it not do? So what, what is, you know, what's the scope of Spectral? Where would you say, these are the problems you should tackle and these ones maybe not? Okay, um, so Spectral is a, a pretty generic tool. And so I always struggle to like, figure out the exact best way to talk about it because it depends who you are and what you're trying to do. But at its most basic spectral is a kind of um it's a json or yaml linter it can lint any json json or yaml or something uh, roughly equivalent with any uh, set of rules that you provide it so it's kind of a rules engine that can that can lint those things and it's not just going to say this is valid json or this is valid yaml but but any rules that you want and so any format that is based on json or yaml can also leverage this um open api uh, uh async api JSON schema are some of the ones that we have kind of core support for in Spectral. Um, so we've built a, a custom rule set, which will basically, well, we've built a core rule set, which will give you a bunch of rules to tell you whether your open API is any good or not. Um, it will tell you whether it's valid or not. Um, it will tell you if you're missing really important things. So if you've missed all of the like uh, operation IDs and, and parameter descriptions, so no one will know what any of that stuff is, like it will, it will suggest that you add those things. Um, and, and so some of those are, are a tad opinionated. We've had to remove a few that are a bit too opinionated. They're like, <laughs> I don't care about operation tags. Stop shouting about tags. What even are tags? So we, we stripped some of those, those rules out. Um, but yeah, it will basically look at your open API documents or other similar API specifications and tell you if you've done something wrong or something silly or something bad, or, or you missed something useful that you could have done. Um, and so you can use this for pretty much anything. You can write your own custom rules, which go beyond looking at the quality of the open API and actually look at the content of the API being described in that open API. So it can complain about your, um, uh, if you use camel case instead of underscores, it can complain about various different things that you train it to complain about. I have one, because I really like the way you put it. So um, I have one specific question about this set of built-in rules around open API. So, I remember, mm -hmm. you, you may know this as well, being a long-time API specialist. In the XML space, there was this idea of strict and lax validation, mm -hmm. where you could say, I want to validate against the schema in that case, and lax would actually have a little more relaxed rules, and strict okay. would be stricter and, you know, like flag everything it could. And, and I'm wondering... Did you do you have that in your built-in rules, or did you decide to just have one set of built-in rules and say these are probably the rules that most people want to see enforced? Yeah, we actually did something along those lines. Um, we have a feature called recommended, and so um, you can you can register the rules as recommended, true or false. Um, and and so when somebody uses that rule set by default, it would just use the recommended rules but you can also specifically tell it to use all the rules and then you get a lot more errors and a lot more blow up. Um, and I've seen this this sort of two tier approach really help. Um, and my previous role, I was at WeWork, there was a hundred and God knows how many APIs and loads of different teams. And a lot of people were very new at open API and a lot of people weren't necessarily very experienced in making APIs at all. So the landscape was a bit of a, bit of a uh, situation. Um, and so trying to roll out this tool, I didn't want to just kind of completely blow up everyone's inbox immediately and just have a thousand errors and they just go no, and just turn it off. Um, yeah. So we had like the basic rules for like, this is a problem. Um, and then there was um, strict, which was a lot more problems. And so once people had kind of solved the basic level, I'd then just kind of go into their into their um, CI and just enable the next level <laughs> and put, put strict on. And then they'd get a lot more feedback and have higher quality things. And, that's a feature we brought over. 
I like it. it's almost I like that. It's almost like video gaming, right? Once you've cleared yeah. the basic level, now you can try to get to the next level and see how you're doing. And it might sure. take you a while, but it's satisfying. I reward people too. So it was um it was we had a a, a, a three tier system, bronze, silver, and gold. And it was li literally just on our list of APIs, it was just an emoji next to the name. It was the easiest feature to implement. But um if you were on basic, uh you would have bronze. If you were on um strict, you'd get silver. And if you were like automatically contract testing your um, your specs against the code to prove that they were valid, you'd get gold and a pizza. <laughs> so I'd buy the entire um, team a pizza if they got to gold. That That's really worked. Cool. So those levels then already went beyond just um, APR linting, right? They had like a little yeah. bigger scope of how well are you doing with just basically helping API governance, so to speak. Yes, exactly. I like that. So, so you briefly mentioned which kind of API descriptions are supported now, mm -hmm. which are, I think, Open API and Async API. Yes. Are there any other plans? I'm really just, you know, I'm just curious to to hear what what it may be on the horizon. Yeah, um, it's tricky. I, I think at some point we'd kind of like to make more of a more of a marketplace where people can kind of share their ideas, right? Because rule sets can be shared as NPM modules um, or they could be shared as just a URL that's plopped around somewhere. So um, we're hoping that more people will want to make more rule sets for more different things. Like a few people asked for RAML support, but it was like three people. So we haven't got around to that yet. If anyone wants to make a RAML rule set, please do. Um, but I think bunging all of those in the core um, just kind of makes life difficult for versioning as well. Because if we decide to get rid of a rule, then that's technically breaking. So we have to like major version the whole thing. Um, so I, I'd like to move towards more of a, a marketplace approach where people can make their own rules for very specific things, maybe um, interesting style guides, maybe um, data formats like JSON API. You know, you, you could you could add support for that. Um, and you could add support for various different gateways like um, Amazon AWS gateway, which kind of uses open API, but not really. So you could make some custom rules that would go, oh, don't do that, that will mess up on AWS. And so people can kind of uh, com comprise the, the ones they want for, for their project, you know? I, I remember us having this conversation when we when we prepped for this interview, the AWS thing, right? Which I found interesting. It's like, yeah, it yeah. is open API sort of, but you better watch out for <laughs> some things or you'll, You'll pay for it later. Yeah. One last general question that I have for you before we dive a little bit into the details. You yourself also worked on a, an API linting tool or API description mm -hmm. linting tool, I should probably say, uh, called Specky. Um, so yeah. can you briefly talk about the history, the differences, and how you would compare, contrast those two? It's just, I mean, it may be interesting to just yeah. better understand, you know, what, what the space looks like of things you could do and where is Specky and Spectral fit into that space? For sure. Um, so yeah, again, when I was working at, at WeWork, um, we were trying to figure out how to kind of make a uh, crazy ecosystem be a bit more consistent. And um, we, I, I looked around for various different, uh, I, I was trying to find an API linter and I couldn't find one. It, since then, a few have popped up, but like if you Google for them, you won't find them. Like you have to know the name of them. And um, a lot of them were internal and more recently kind of appeared out somewhere or had funny names. But um, I ended up making this tool uh, with a lot of help from Mike Ralfson. He made um, Swagger to open API. And inside in, in, the, in the code, there was this like utility called Linter, uh, Linter, which was just like to make sure that the tests were valid. Um, and, and it had a few rules in there. I was like, oh, that's really good. So I kind of copied and pasted a bunch of code and, and brought it over into this more um, generally useful uh, CLI tool. So you could just run this CLI and, and just fire it at any, any different open API file. Um, I think it only worked with open API three and I mean, it only worked with open API. So spectral is designed in a bit of a different way where instead of kind of in Specky, you, you mention the like the object name and all the object names are open API specific. So you mentioned like path object or path item object or operation or whatever. Um, whereas in, in spectral you have, um, it just works on any JSON YAML file by using JSON path as the selector instead. Um, so yeah, Specky was basically very targeted at just open API three, which was fine at the time. 
Um, and it was just me working on it with occasional help from Mike Rousen with loads of people going, oh, this is really good. I want... but, but no time to actually work on it. Um, and then once I left WeWork, it was just completely abandoned immediately and no one, you know, no one did anything on it. So it's it's gone now, which is a little sad, but Spectral does everything that that did and a lot more. And it's built using TypeScript. So there's quite a few less wacky zany errors that pop up. Yeah, thanks for that backstory. Um, the, the one part that I find fascinating, but we won't dive into it because it's probably just me, but it's this this difference of level, right? Where you said, like like you said, Specky is basically a tool that works on an open API, whereas yeah. Spectral is actually a tool that works on JSON or YAML, and then it has some built-in things that make it useful for open API, but it's like this additional mm -hmm. layer in there, which of course makes it more general, but also adds some let's say complication and how you make it work best with open api so that i find that fascinating but anyway so thanks a lot for the intro and what i want to also want to do today a little bit is talk about how spectral actually works we won't go into any of the details but from just looking briefly into it i i found that the Fundamental concepts in Spectral that you need to understand are functions, rules, and rule sets. Yep. Could you just briefly tell us, you know, what these things do and how you combine them, let's say, in a mm -hmm. typical scenario? Yeah. So basically, the main the main thing is linting, right? When you use Spectral, um, you're either using it in the CLI or in in JavaScript or uh, an extension. This it kind of comes packaged in a bunch of, bunch of different ways, but the, um, the main thing it's doing is usually linting. Um, the linter will take a uh, target open API file or whatever, a document, um, and it will also take a rule set. Uh, rule set is a set of rules. It's kind of a, a collection of rules that are bundled up somehow. So those are either you know a file or a URL or, or an NPM package. It's all just kind of a, a set of rules somehow. Um, and each one of those rules will basically have a selector. We mentioned it's JSON path. So the rule will say, you know, look at that bit of the file and then um, apply this function to it. And that function could be um, uh, that some, sometimes it's uh, regex based. Sometimes it's just, is it true? Does it exist? Um, sometimes it's, you know, various different functions. Uh, the Zor and, and you know, um, you can even apply JSON schemas to it, which is a bit too meta because you can apply JSON schemas to JSON schema. Uh, uh, but yeah, basically a rule is just saying, you know, this bit of the JSON object should agree with this function, should get a true out of this function. And if not, that function will emit some sort of message, which will then show up in the list of results. Um, and all results are, um, you know, just like just like ESLint, RuboCop, any sort of linting tool you can think of that. Um, there's info, warning, oh, there's hint, info, warning, error are the severities that it supports. Um, so you can, you can do things like make it, I think by default it will show anything um, and only fail if there's an error. But you can you can set it up to if you want you can tell it to fail if there's a, a an info you can kind of change all these things to to control how much you care. Um, so yeah, I mean that's pretty much basics of it. That that tells you a little bit of the general structure, let's say, of how you actually write down the rules. Mm -hmm. One question I have is that as as you told us earlier on there are these built-in rules for let's say open api for example where you also talked about well you can make those mm -hmm. more strict or less strict depending on how picky you are about certain things yeah what i'm interested in is from what you've seen in general usage have you seen people mostly using spectral to just enforce those rules basically using it as a out-of-the-box tool that does useful stuff or have you seen a lot of usage writing their own rule sets or extending the existing rule sets? Let's probably put it like this, saying that, oh, it's a tool, but I actually you know, can configure and adapt it to my needs, and that's what I'll be doing. So what, 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 what is your perspective on how people are using it right now? Uh, I don't have any uh, actual statistics on this, but I feel like it's like 95% of people just use the out-of-the-box tools, <laughs> the uh, the out-of-the-box open API support. Um, there are a bunch of people using, um, you know, custom rule sets. Uh, I mean, Adidas are a, a great example. Um, 
they have basically kind of taken their taken their API style guide, which was previously written down um, in in text form, and they've taken as many of those rules as they can and, and started putting them into into Spectral. IBM are doing the same. They kind of got rid of their in house thing, and they've slowly been moving one rule at a time over to Spectral to to do the same. But I, I think I think most people. Because it does the because out of the box you can just run Spectral, tell it to lint, and then give it an open API file, and it does. I think that that simplicity makes people think, oh, that's that's the tool, great, yeah, that works fine, um, and they don't necessarily feel the need to delve deeper. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the word linting itself is a tricky one. I feel like you know marketing people could probably do a better job at this, but. Um, like linting itself, a lot of people are used to that. Like a JSON linter usually just means like, is the JSON valid? So when we describe it as a JSON linter with open API support, they're just like, oh, well, now it tells me if the open API is valid as well. Um, but kind of going I can, further. I can agree, you know, for that. I think linting, linting typically is more than just, more than just validation. You know, yeah. It's not just validating against does it strictly follow the rules it needs to follow but like is it is it looking good in in a more yeah. fuzzy way than just is it right or wrong and i i, and I think that really is uh you know that is the power behind it because like you said right i mean like just checking an open api for is it oh is it technically okay there there are a bunch of tools you can use for that and yeah. even if you use spectral out of the box it already does more than that mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I I agree. I think most people, I think a lot of people don't have the same definition of what lint means, and so they're carrying this this like valid or not definition, and so they just when when the tool by default gives them lots of information, they're like, oh yeah, good, that told me whether it was valid or not. That's helpful. Uh, and so trying to trying to get people to go to the next level of you can actually use this to create a style guide for your entire organization, which you know where different departments might have you know different rules, all extending the same base. Um, uh, you know, that sort of uh, implementation of this generic tool is something that I'm trying to get out there. I've done a few conference talks and, and I've done a few blog posts about it. Um, but generally speaking, like, I, I, I'll explain that to people and they'll be like, God damn, that's really useful. <laughs> I didn't know I could do that. I've been using Spectral for a year. I had no idea. So, um, yeah, it's an education thing, I think. Yeah, and that's I, I've noticed. <laughs> so, so that, which is why I'm really interested in that. And even though in 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 this specific interview, all I wanted to do was talk with you about the general concept and so forth. Mm -hmm. What I would like to do is kind of as a teaser, what you can actually do for the full power. If you could just briefly talk about this idea of inheritance and how that specific mm. concepts could map let's say to more complex use cases than just this simple uh, validation linting whatever you call it right but this more um let's say component-based set of rules you might have i got you um so at, at very large companies um often you won't necessarily need the exact same API style guide for, for everything. So one example, just to go back to WeWork, because it's you know one I have, um, I, I created this kind of base level of rules where we were going to try and agree on using, um, uh, what was it? I think it was hyphen case for everything. That was like one thing that basically everyone agreed on for URLs. Um, and uh, we were like banning HTTP basic from being used anywhere because we got burned a few times with that. And so like there were these set of rules that basically everyone could agree on um, that was quite handy for consistency. Um, and uh, I, I think those were the public APIs that seemed the most important. So uh, if, if they were going to be used by another company, you'd want to make sure that all the public APIs, regardless of what company um, or what department uh, that API was made by, they should look very much the same. Um, and then kind of internally, there was another set of rules that everyone agreed on that might not um, might not be as big or long as the as the public list, um, but we kind of agreed on those. So you'd pick public or internal as your starting point. Um, and then different departments, they'd have their own styles and standards. Like some people would use JSON API, some people would use HAL, and some people would use GraphQL, so they couldn't use the tool, whatever. Um, and so these different kind of groups started to kind of focus on, on different things that they cared about um, their APIs having. And, and we started to come up with rules like, uh, uh, what was it? You need to have slash health because we we implemented this um, yeah. company-wide health checker that would ping slash health. Uh, so we made a rule for that saying, where is it? 
Um, and, and as a company, when we started trying to standardize on, on uh, error formats, it was like, okay, you need to use RFC 7807 or JSON API errors, one of the two, whatever, there's a few of them. But people could basically you know, pick the, the core open API as one rule set they'd extend, and then internal versus external as another one, um, mm -hmm. and then like their department's rule set as another one. Um, and they'd get kind of a, a superset of all those rules being applied to their API. I like that. I find that fascinating. It's it's really this like component based approach, and and I I can I can identify at least three different axes where this. So one that you already mentioned, right? With this, I mean, what I usually say is public, partner, and private. Like sometimes mm -hmm. there's three levels, yeah, yeah. or it may be internal, external, like you said. But the kind of visibility of the API that's mm -hmm. important. Then the organizational unit, I think that's important as well, definitely. The larger the organization, the more you have that. And the third one that I also see pro probably being useful is some kind of life cycle, you know, some kind of maturity thing where you might say, you know, if you're just getting started, just make sure it's technically okay. But if you wanna if you wanna keep it around, right, and then take it seriously, then really make sure that it kind of you grow up a little bit along with your API. So that's yes. another possible axis I think you could you could pick. Mm -hmm. Any closing words from your side? I think we covered a good ground. Um, I hope that everybody by now gets has some idea around what Spectral does, what it can do for you, what kind of, let's say, aspect it targets in the general API governance and lifecycle space. Are there any things you would like to add before we close up? Um, I think people should just give it a try. I think it's kind of a, a fun tool that does a whole lot more than you think. And uh, yeah, if you head over to stoplight.io up in the top corner, there's an open source uh, section. Head over there and look at our, you know, our free stuff you can play around with. Um, and there's Spectral and, and, and Prism, another similarly fun tool. Um, and just poke around the docs and give them a try and, and see how it works. Um, it, it's really fun to like run them against your uh, your open API and see what it shouts at you about. Because um, I've run it against all sorts of things. I run it against Stripe, I run it against GitHub, and it finds like legitimate errors with their open API. So I'm like, hey guys, you should fix it. So it, it, can, it can find a lot of problems um, that you might not know about. So it's good to do that. One last question I have because you just said that. Is there a place where I can do that online? You know, where I can just go and submit an open API and get the spectral results without having to install it myself? Sadly not. Uh, we do want to make a, an API for it because, again, that's fun and meta. An API to check your API could be quite fun. Um, and I was also thinking about kind of coming up with a scorecard system, you know, like SSL labs that, that check your SSL certificates good. You get like an A plus if you do all the things. I was thinking about having like a really opinionated version of of spectral where you, you put it in it's like oh you, you haven't got any hypermedia links in there that's not rest um <laughs> just whatever you could you could make it fill approved you know like the highest yeah. level is fill approves <laughs> yeah one day one day yeah okay but there's no online place where you can just submit it but you can download install it's it's mm. based on node.js so should yeah, be. npm install, you've got it in, in seconds. So that's, for now, the easiest way of doing it. There's Docker, too, if you don't want to mess around with npm. So okay. a few ways to install. Phil, thank you very much. That was really informative. I hope that a lot of people will check it out and see how useful it is and start using it. And if there's any questions you have, any comments you have, please make sure that you you know leave them here in, with that video, wherever the button may be. And if there's any interest, um, I think we also would be more than happy to dive deeper maybe in a, in a future video. Yeah, I'd be happy to take it for a spin and show you how it works sometime. That'd be good. That'd be great. OK, thank you very much for joining, Phil. And yeah, thanks, thanks everybody, for watching. So until next time, all the best. Bye.